Welcome. Crack open a tip of Genesee and watch the pictures as they travel through your neighbor's Wi-Fi. It's the Rees Company. I'm the bull of American broadcasting alongside the great Chris Morganti. How are you, Chris? I'm good. And uh, tonight we're very excited to share with you a, a film we've watched and we'll be commenting on. It's called The Stranger Beside Me. It's our movie of the week of the week. Shall we just dive right into this? Sure. Okay, let's have the intro, Jim. <laughs> The Stranger Beside Me. It aired on ABC on September 17th, 1995. Now, it shares a title with a true crime book by Anne Rule regarding her relationship with Ted Bundy. Okay. But uh, that film, I mean, that book and this film share uh, nothing but a title. Right. Uh, it stars Tiffany Amber Thiessen. Now, um, she had already been in Saved by the Bell. At this point, she was appearing in a show very close to your heart, I'm learning. Yes, uh, 90210. Now, what is your uh, fascination with 90210? Um, I wouldn't call it a fascination so much. but uh, It comes up a lot, Chris. Um, well, yeah, because look at what we're doing on this show. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I think one of the main reasons was uh, the uh, like they graduated high school in 1993, mm -hmm. as did I. And now you all know how old I am. But um, So they were at the same stage in life that I was in, and I just started watching it when I was in high school. So you identified with the characters. Well, I wouldn't say it go that far, but uh, I, liked, I liked the subject matter, and I don't know. Now, a couple of weeks ago, I had texted you about something, and uh, something about 90210 came up, and you said, well, coincidentally, I just watched an episode of 90210 three hours ago. Yeah. Is this something you do regularly? No, not regularly, but it, it, it had. I was looking for something to watch, and, and it just... It was the only thing on. Does it hold up for you? No. I mean, it's still enjoyable every once in a while to watch an episode, but, you know, but, I've seen them all at this point. But what do you find enjoyable? So, there's not a lot of rewatching. I mean, once you've seen them several times, how many, you know, you know, I don't know. But do you find something enjoyable about it still? Nostalgia. That's what it is. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> so it stars Tiffany Emberthies and, and Eric Close, who has had a vast and varied TV career. He's probably best known for his role uh, in the series Without a Trace. Okay. That ran for a while. Okay. I've heard of it, so it must be pretty big because I don't really pay close attention to these things. Now, Chris, do you remember a show from the 1980s called Simon and Simon? I remember the name of it. Never saw it. Well, uh, it's about a pair of brothers who are private investigators, and it co-starred Jameson Parker. He played A.J. Simon. Okay. He also appeared in two of the movies we've watched so far. One of those, um, well, you may remember him from our discussion on the film, uh, Who is Julia? He played the guy who wears a sweater on his flight from Acapulco to Los Angeles. Uh, we have a photo right here. He was also in A Violation of Trust, in which he portrayed a police officer who does an anti-drug puppet show. You may remember that. Yeah, I think we all remember that. <laughs> well, he's And also we had a lot to say about his his uh, uh, costumes in that movie as well. So right, right. He, see, he seems to be involved in a lot of odd costume choices <laughs> in his movies. And none are explained. Uh, he's not in this week's film. But it does feature his TV brother and partner in the Simon & Simon Detective Agency, mm. Rick Simon, known in real life as Gerald McCraney. Now, this show, Simon & Simon, uh, did these detectives have like a hot rod that they drove around? Because that seemed to be... A necessity for every mid-80s detective show. They probably did. I'm not familiar enough. Yeah. I do kind of remember the theme song, but that's about it. So If, uh, if you didn't have a sports car, you weren't allowed to be a private detective in TV's 1980s. That was the rule. Yeah. So we've had A.J. Simon, and now we have Rick Simon. So if you're keeping a score at home, well, you have a very profound misunderstanding of what kind of show this is. Yeah. So the film You is, need more hobbies. Yes, please. This film, uh, again, it's titled The Stranger Beside Me, and it starts at a small-town Memorial Day celebration. Dave Morgan, that's Gerald McCraney. He rolls up to his um, daughter, maybe? I, it's unclear. It's very unclear. I, it, it's kind of implied that it's not his daughter. Right, but, but they have the same surname. 
and what their relationship is is never explained. It's uh, we know uh, she's his caretaker. Okay, but it appears as though they're father and daughter, but that's never uh, that's never really explained. So he rolls up to his daughter literally because he's in a wheelchair. Yeah, Major Dud. His daughter and slash or caretaker is called Jennifer Morgan. She's an artist, and Dave wants her to be more social. What are you doing over here all by yourself? Getting to be downright antisocial. Not antisocial. It's it's pro art. Well, spending time alone's all right, I guess. Spending all your time alone, Jen, that's uh, that's not so great. I know. You're right. Well, there's uh, this new ritual. It's called dating. Get yourself all dressed up, uh, get nervous, go out to an expensive restaurant. You ought to try it sometime. Hi, see there? It's a nice guy. I think he's a little too much of an animal for me. I can only guess that's a Memorial Day tribute to those we lost in guerrilla warfare. Mm. Clever pun. It should be noted that that's not a real gorilla. Right. It's a guy in a suit. It's just a guy in a suit, Chris. Well, that's how he picks up women. Oh, okay. Well, it seems to be very effective, or at least uh, for the moment. Uh, His name is Chris Gallagher, and later on, he's wearing street clothes, and he reintroduces himself to Jennifer, this time properly. He even asks her on a date, Mm. and she says no. Well, soon after, Dave and Jennifer, they're sitting in their yard, and Chris appears. This time, he bears flowers. It turns out Dave has invited him. Chris once again asks Jennifer out. She's again resistant, but Dave pressures her into saying yes, and she agrees, but with reluctance. So they go on a picnic. Yeah. And it goes pretty well. Let's take a look at their date. All right. You know, I only have six weeks left, and then I'm leaving. Leaving for where? The Navy. Really? Uh, something I've wanted to do ever since I was a little kid, so I'm going to give it a whirl. And there's two things I need to do before I go. And what's that? Get in shape for basic training and kick back. <laughs> you know, it's nice to have someone to kick back with. How can a man simultane- simultaneously resemble Rob Lowe and Bob Saget? It's yeah. very weird. Keep, keep an eye on this guy. You'll see what I mean. Yeah. Chris? Yep. So, um... <clears throat> A week passes, and Chris and Jennifer are about to turn up the heat. Let's see this. I want to make love to you. No, I, I gotta stop. No, 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 I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's just that I'm, I'm crazy about you, Jen. Nice. Nice. What's next? Oh, well, we have a little more. Oh, okay. Yeah. Two years ago, I was raped. She ruined it. Yep, she ruined it. (laughs) Continue. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So it was a friend's father who committed the, uh, as we say, deadly justice against Jennifer. Chris proposes marriage to Jennifer and promises that if they marry, she'll never have to worry about anything like that happening to her again. He'll protect her. Off camera, she accepts the proposal. We next see their wedding day. During the reception, Jennifer finds Chris's cousin Dana sitting alone in the the chapel. Dana is played by a young Allison Hannigan. Dana? You having fun? Sure. Well, you look pretty. Is everything okay? Perfect. I love looking like a stupid prom date in front of everyone. I don't know why you married my cousin anyway. You won't be happy. Dana, shut up. Uh, 
All right. Yeah. yeah so uh, they get married. They move uh, to the naval base. And they quickly make friends in their new surroundings. Jennifer's friends uh, include a fellow Navy wife, played by country singer Lori Morgan. Yeah, I didn't. Uh, I wasn't familiar with her, and uh, you mentioned she was some sort of country singer. Yeah. So, uh, I, you know, I looked up some of her music, and uh, it stinks. Well, uh, you don't like it? No. She reminds me of a low rent Florence Henderson. Okay. If they want. People to stop kneeling during the national anthem, they should just have her sing it. <laughs> People get up and walk out. Okay, so not not a fan. No. Okay. Well, you seem a bit cranky tonight. Maybe maybe you go sit down for a little bit. And, oh. I don't know. You never know what you're getting with him. Yeah, sometimes, you know. But uh, Lori Morgan, uh, I'll give you a little background. Now, you only heard the music. Puppet Jamie Walters only heard the music. But um, I'll give you a little bit of her personal life. She's the real-life daughter of country music, music legend George Morgan. Great. No idea who he is either. She's also the widow of country music legend Keith Whitley. This is confusing because half the characters in this movie are named Morgan. <laughs> and her name is Morgan. I don't know. <laughs> She's also the uh, ex-wife of both Sammy Kershaw and John Randall, two guys who recorded and released a lot of country music. Great. I've seen her live, by the way. <laughs> How? And I even met her on one occasion. You, you paid for this privilege. Yeah, right, right. Okay. All right. So, well, she was opening for Clint Black, who, of whom I'm a fan. Yeah. Well, that I can see, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, she seemed very uh, Baptist church choirish to me. You didn't care for the uh, vocal stylings? Nope. Well, second generation. She had a good run. So, Lori Morgan's character, her name is Nancy. She's part of a group of hens who are into all the hot goss on the bass. Chris... You like films that are 90210 adjacent? Mm. I like the ones that give me the chance to say hot goss. Nice. We're not going to see much of Nancy, Lori Morgan's character, but when we have someone like her in the cast, we should give her the screen time she deserves. So here she is introducing Jen Jennifer to the no secrets world of military wifery. Things like this usually don't come up in conversation. Well, you're in the Navy now, and everybody knows everything. <laughs> Take old Steve over there, your sweetie's new boss. Chief engineer on the Marlin. Great chief. Comes out and drinks with his crew. So who cares if he has a little foot fetish? <laughs> Why else would I have married him? <laughs> well, they're very nice. <laughs> weird. Yeah, that, that is kind of weird. So Chris, Jennifer's husband, not our Chris, uh, he gets to go aboard the submarine he'll be working on. And the confinement makes him very uncomfortable. Mm. Jennifer lands a job with Nancy, who runs a daycare. You don't think you would have taken a tour of a submarine before you joined the Navy? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Maybe he wasn't expecting to be on a submarine. I suppose. Maybe he wanted to be a pilot. Wow. You, know, you don't just sign up to the Navy and hope to be a pilot. <laughs> That's not how it works. He said in that earlier clip that it was a longtime dream of his, a lifelong dream to join the Navy. Yeah, I so you think you would maybe look into it a little bit. <laughs> maybe take some, you know, go down to the Inner Harbor in Baltimore, <laughs> tour a couple of the ships, see what it's like. I don't know. Or just <laughs> jump right in. Turns out he's claustrophobic and seasick. Yeah. <laughs> Bad combination to be a submariner. <laughs> so Lori Morgan hires um, Jennifer to work at her daycare that she owns and runs. So Jennifer comes home with that news. And uh, Chris is unenthused because after his first day on duty, she wasn't there when he came home. So he goes for a run. In fact, Chris, he goes for a run every evening. Mm. Here's what's going on in town during one such run. These people don't have questions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, it's oh, all good. He it's apologized, all good. so. <laughs> hey, buddy. You out for a run? Chris, did you see anyone out here just now? What? 
Someone's looking in the window at Gina. Are you kidding me? Did you call the cops? Not yet. Well, whoever it was couldn't have gone far. Why don't you go down by the officer's mess? I'll go this way and we'll be back. Yeah. Now I might be on the wrong side of this issue, Steve. But, uh... <laughs> yeah. I feel like if, if you're bathing in the nude, it's up to you to close your windows and draw a blind or a curtain or something. If you leave the windows wide open and somebody happens to see it, I, it's fair game to me. Well, that's, that's one way of looking at it. But this is more than just happening upon it. He's there for that purpose, whoever sure. this is. Yeah. He, it turns out, we'll find out later, he's up to some other no-goodery. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, the search, Chris, and that other guy, uh, they, they, um, they go out on, uh, it produces no results in finding the man who spied on Gina. Right. So the next day, Nancy and her friends discuss the creepery from the night before. It's apparently a regular thing on the base, with other wives uh, reporting similar incidents. Jennifer doesn't know that Chris helped try, uh, helped try to uh, locate the offender. Chris says he didn't want her to know about the serial snooper. It might have scared her, having been deadly justiced herself. That night, Gina, the woman we just saw getting out of the shower, um, she gets a deadly justicing of her own. So Jennifer is on it. Are the windows open? Uh, uh, you know what? <laughs> All right. It's not relevant. It, it's not relevant. I'm sorry, folks. Was the door unlocked? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <we're, laughs> so Jennifer, uh, she's very antsy and uh, anxious uh, with the knowledge that there, there's a guy creeping around the base. She brings this up to Chris, who is about to be deployed, leaving her home alone, which I'm sure is adding to her anxiety. Let's, let's see the discussion they have about it. Mothers, Sandy's a basket case, and me. My stomach jumps just thinking about going out, even in broad daylight. Just don't get all freaked out over this guy, Jen. Did I not tell you I would protect you? Honey, of course. It's just that, what if I'm alone and he breaks in? God, Jen, all you do is worry about this guy. What about me? I've got 10 days and then I am gone for three months. Three months! Stuck down in that rat hole with people watching me all the time. You know, sometimes I think you can't wait for me to leave. Wow. Yeah, they're kind of insensitive. Yes, that's a good word for it. Yeah. To say the least, a very strong reaction. And Chris does apologize that night, as does Jennifer, strangely, for forgetting that Chris can be scared, too. Mm. He describes the submarine as like being in a tomb. Well, yeah. Yeah, it takes a special type of person to do that work, which is why usually <laughs> the people who volunteer or get picked for it uh, know what they're in for, but I, I, don't, I don't know. I, I, think his, <laughs> I think his only reason for joining the Navy is he heard the song Yellow Submarine. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he seems to have no knowledge of what a submarine actually is. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so he's, he's concerned about being in that confined space with no privacy. Um, but that turns out to be premature. He soon has good news. He talked to the chief, who was Nancy's husband. Mm. Uh, he told the chief about how uncomfortable the submarine makes him, and instead of beating the crap out of him, <laughs> the chief has him reassigned to an import crew. Yeah, I don't think a chief can, whatever. Yeah, this is, this I think that's an officer-level decision, but I, you know, what do I know? <sighs> I, I, I think this may be why we've started to lose wars in the century. Yeah, or, or at the very least, they should have had a military consultant on this film, maybe. <laughs> But Chris hasn't told Jennifer the Maybe whole story. Maybe they didn't. He kept, he kept going around, <laughs> peeping in the uh, actresses' <laughs> trailers. <laughs> what? <laughs> Isn't that what this is about? <laughs> That's very silly. I'm sorry. That's fine. But there's more to the story about uh, Chris being reassigned to an import crew. Mm. Um, Chris doesn't tell Jennifer this. She finds out. From uh, Nancy. By accident. Hi. Hey. So, did you hear about Chris? I heard. How is he? Are you kidding? He's bouncing off walls. He's so happy to be off the soap. Listen, tell Steve thanks for being so nice about it. Oh, he was happy to do it. And the counselor that he suggested that Chris go to, he's a great guy. So you might want to consider going with Chris. Uh, counselor? What counselor? 
have opened my mouth again. Yes, you have. What? Well, Chris went to see Steve and told him that he'd kill himself if he had to go to sea. Kind of extreme. Yeah. By the way, I will point this out about Lori Morgan. I am uh, very familiar with her music. Okay. And it's interesting. There are certain people who, when you hear them talk, it sounds like their singing voice. Oh, yeah? Yeah, like Daryl Hall. When he talks, he sounds like Daryl Hall. Okay. Even though he's only talking and not singing. They, she has a vocal quality that uh, comes through whether she's uh, singing or speaking. Interesting. Yeah, so uh, Jennifer brings up this whole counseling thing she had not heard about. Yeah. She brings that up to Chris, and he once again reacts negatively. He calls Jennifer a spy. Mm. So as they arrive home after leaving the bar, uh, law enforcement converges. And Chris is placed under arrest for criminal voy- voyeurism, I believe it's pronounced. Let's, uh, let's see. This is crazy. Chris didn't do anything. God, why are you guys doing this to us? We are normal people. Can't you see that? Chris would never look through windows. I believe he did more than that. I believe your husband's a rapist. What? Yeah. So Chris is able to convince Jennifer that he's innocent. He's being held pending arraignment. So home alone, Jennifer is on edge. She kills over in the kitchen. Nancy enters. She's brought Jennifer food and insists that she take her to a physician. Now, I think we all know where this is going. Uh, I don't know if I saw it coming or not, but uh, yeah. It, it seemed to me the way that scene, uh, and we're not going to see it, but uh, the, way, the way that scene was set up and she's all of a sudden sick, just going about things. It seemed obvious to me that a pregnancy was ahead of us. You know what? Now I remember actually when I started this movie, it was at that scene uh, for whatever reason. And so I actually, that was the first thing I saw. It was her saying the news that oh, we're about oh. to see. <laughs> yeah. So that's why it wasn't, that's why I didn't, uh, yeah. So uh, to, pre- to prepare for arraignment, Chris meets with his attorney. Did we say what the news was? Yeah, yeah. She's pregnant. Yeah. Oh, okay, I well, didn't know I, if we actually said I, that. I think we okay. said enough to make that clear. Yeah. Uh, so Chris and his attorney are meeting uh, to discuss the arraignment. Jennifer is on hand as well. He's being charged now with criminal trespassing. That's it. Yeah, they dropped the... Uh, they couldn't... They didn't have a case for the rape charges. Right, right. Despite... Finding uh, duct tape. Deadly justice. Uh, duct tape. What else did they find in his car? Uh, ba- ba- bloody bandages. Rope. Uh, uh, rope. Well, <laughs> I believe they found it uh, in his garbage. Yeah. Well, actually, that, that does give some plausible deniability, I suppose. I thought they found it in his trunk. So uh, Jennifer is relieved to learn that deadly justice is not on the table. And nor is it a charge uh, her husband is facing. When the lawyer leaves to allow Chris and Jennifer to discuss how he'll plea, Chris confesses to her that, uh, yeah, he's looked into some windows. Yeah. He apologizes, but Jennifer is not receptive. Why don't you tell this to our child, she says. And that's how he finds out that she's expecting. Yeah. So Chris appears now in court dressed like Fred Astaire and follow the fleet. Mr. Gallagher? Is that even a military You've been charged with anymore? criminal trespass. How do you plead? I don't know. Guilty, Your Honor. Your Honor, Mr. Gallagher is an active duty seaman. The uniform tipped me off. Mr. Danko, I understand you have a request for disposition? Yes, Your Honor. The Navy would like to discipline Seaman Gallagher internally. Or they have mine. He will be rotated back to his site of enlistment in New Mexico. He's agreed to enroll in a psychiatric therapy program, and then he will be discharged. New Mexico sounds far enough for me. The court hands the case back to the Navy for disposition. Mr. Gallagher, you're free to leave. Thank you, Your Honor. Yeah, not much of a punishment. Right. Well, I mean, they didn't get him on the deadly justice, so right. it's really not much of a crime either. Like I said, the window was open. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jennifer leaves the courtroom and Chris follows her. He begs her forgiveness and says he has a problem. He admits he has a problem. And he compares it to uh, like a drug problem. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And he just needs help. He needs specifically her help. So they leave the base and they move in with Dave, Gerald McCraney. Yeah. Why don't you leave our window open and then I won't have to go sneaking around on the neighbors. (laughs) I could just stand in the backyard. 
Well, uh, Dave, uh, he doesn't know about the criminal charge, and Jennifer explains that the Navy just isn't what Chris thought it would be, which is clearly true. Right. It's just He doesn't have the whole story, but the Navy is clearly <laughs> not what Chris thought it would be. So Chris gets a job working construction, and... This what? is nothing like Pirates of Penzance. <laughs> <laughs> One day, he's sent on a trip uh, to procure some drywall, and he espies a woman gardening in her yard. Let's see what happens. <laughs> now, Steve, I know they're trying to I mean, they're trying to set the whatever here, but I mean, I've done that. <laughs> Come on. Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, I was uh, distracted. Sorry. <laughs> I mean, Come on. <laughs> well, yeah, but you're also not attacking people or allegedly. Yeah, but to believe it. Right. Yeah. But they're mixing these horrible acts that this man has done in with these things that, frankly, uh, you know. But it's different. If you if you do that, it's a lot different than someone who has an intention to go back. That's true. And do something. That's about. true. I've only ever gone back once. <laughs> if I were him, I would have gone back and given her a cheeseburger. <laughs> you can see her ribs, Chris. It's disgusting. I get it. Yeah. <clears throat> so Chris and Jennifer are about to move into a home of their own. And on the day they do... Jennifer notices that the car is lower on gas than it should be, yeah. given uh, the travel that they've uh, done. Right. So Chris blows up at her, figuring she must suspect him of being back on the neighborhood prowl. Yeah. So he storms off in the car at speed. And uh, that night, with Chris still MIA, Jennifer goes into labor, while concurrently something else is taking place. Is that a dog? I don't know what the fuck's going on, but I just Sounds like a dog. Let me turn it on. Can you hear me? Yeah. We actually have a strange emergency happening in studio right now, or outside of studio. There is uh, somebody caterwauling. Uh, hopefully it's an animal, not a human. Um, but uh, there may be a TV movie in our future based on what we're hearing uh Ambiently, I hope everything's all right. And it sounds to me like uh, I'm getting information that it's a dog. And uh, that sounds terrible. I hope the dog is not in any way harmed. Uh, do we have any information? In my expert opinion as someone who owned a dog for 40 years, I believe that's a dog barking. Barking? Just, just as they normally do. It doesn't sound like barking. It, had a very, it sounded like someone was being uh, attacked or a dog had somehow come to harm. It sounds different when you hear it outside. But, yeah, it, it, it's one of those dogs that has a very annoying bark. You know, like a screech, like a screeching bark. Okay. Yeah. Usually tends to be like a smaller dog, you know. But, yeah, I think everything's okay. We could find out differently on the news tomorrow, but who knows. All right, well, in that case. Um, so, yeah, Chris is not around. Jennifer goes into labor. Well, I was checking on the dog. I'm back. It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> Let's uh, continue with the scene. <laughs> A little girl. She's perfect, Jen. And then tell her that she's beautiful. Okay. Yeah, this is a point where he's crossed in from harmless hijinks into. Uh, Obviously a very serious crime. Right. So I'm going to stop making those kind of jokes. Did that scene remind you of any other movie? No. It's a movie you've mentioned. Okay. Many times. Pirates of Penzance? No, <laughs> no uh, The Godfather. 
Oh, okay. During the baptism, when uh, subsequently, and not subsequently, but concurrently, oh yes, all of the other major crime family bosses are being murdered during the baptism. Yeah, yeah. And it goes back and forth. That uh, that reminded me of this. Yeah, I get it. Or this reminded me of that rather. You get thrown off when you think you hear the the sounds of a human drawing his last breath. <laughs> <laughs> all clinging to life. That was a bizarre situation. But uh, I think I held it together, and uh, <laughs> and you'll see the result. Oh, man. <clears throat> all right, so Jennifer comes home from the hospital with uh, Dana in tow. She's the cousin, Chris's cousin, okay. the, the gloomy gal, the naysayer at the wedding reception. Allison Hannigan. Yes. And uh, they find that all of Chris's and Jennifer's belongings, it's all been unpacked. She hasn't seen Chris since he stormed off that day. He did pop into the hospital without her knowledge, which is kind of his strong suit. Right. And uh, he peeked in on Jennifer and their daughter, Molly Gallagher. While Jennifer wonders aloud where Chris could be, Dana has a further warning for Jennifer. You can't let him near her. What are you talking about? There are things that you don't know. You have to protect her. Protect her from who? From Chris. He would come into my room at night when I was a kid. At first, he would just tell me stories. But then he wanted to touch me. I said it was okay. I didn't know. I was just a little kid. Chen, you have to keep him away. He's a monster. Yeah. Now, by the way, I'd like to point out, uh, you've probably noticed that uh, the clips we're watching, the soundtrack is a bit off. That is not yeah. us. That is the source material. Yeah. But it's what we have to work with. It came and went with the, when we were watching it. But um, right. Now, you would think if somebody came up to you at, at your wedding day and said, uh, don't marry this man, you're not going to be happy. And then you found out that he was accused by the local police of rape. Uh, suspected, I should say. Deadly justice. Yeah. Uh, you don't think you'd go circle back and have a conversation with that person? <laughs> <laughs> it feels like this conversation should have happened a lot earlier, but, you know. Yeah, or maybe pursued it with a line of questioning. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Not, not everybody, apparently. Well, Jennifer now, she can't sleep. She won't let Molly, that's her daughter, out of her sight. So she makes a late-night call to the detective who arrested Chris for criminal trespass, who had also su suspected him of deadly justice. As far as he's concerned, Chris is guilty as soon. Jennifer decides to leave. Let's see how this goes for her. What's going on? Stay away from me. Dana told me everything. She told me what you did to her. What are you talking about? Dana lies. Did the police in California lie too? I know you did it. I know you raped Gina. I'm taking Molly with me. We'll be at Dave's. Put the bag away. Goodbye, Chris. I said, put the bag away! Stop it! <laughs> when I tell you to do something, you do it! <laughs> yeah. Yep. So a neighbor calls in a disturbance complaint. Police arrive and arrest Chris for assault, even though no one said anything about assault. Right. So at the also, station, also there's obviously not a lot going on on the uh, naval base because uh, are they they're not even in the naval base. No, they're anymore. off the naval base now. He had to move, uh, I guess, to uh, New Mexico where they started all this. Right. Yeah, but the cops show up like five seconds after this all begins, <laughs> so, uh, yeah. and they arrest him. And then at the station, Jennifer's statement is taken by a cop who happens to be Chris's friend. Now this is established earlier that he has a friend in law enforcement. But none of those scenes were really of any value to us other than just to point it out now. Right, right. <clears throat> so Chris's friend doesn't want to hear about uh, the guy's past and what, what that might mean for the community he has been sworn to protect. He tells Jennifer just to focus on the argument that she and Chris had that night so that they can all move on. Well, Jennifer visits Chris in jail. 
and he all but confesses to everything he's suspected of, including the deadly justices. Mm -hmm. But there's nothing she can do about it, he says, because nobody will believe her. So he's freed. Apparently, she's dropped the charges, um, feeling powerless. And he comes to pick up uh, Jennifer and Molly. Dave, again, Gerald McCraney, he's smartened up to Chris's behavior. And he's oh, not Dr. Best. Strangelove. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. And uh, he's not best pleased, but there's little he can do in this and, quite frankly, most situations. Well, I don't know, Steve. Um, a restraining order, maybe? Just a thought. It's a consideration. Yeah. So Chris is now being an open neighborhood deadly justicer. Justicer. At least to Jennifer. Let's see this. It's a nice house. You know, a house that nice probably has a beautiful woman somewhere in it. Probably tall and blonde. Probably takes long showers in the afternoon. All right, I'm out of here. He's flaunting it at this point. Yeah. I th- lack of a better term. And if you couldn't make it out, the headline we just saw in that newspaper says a sixth woman has been assaulted. At this point, Jennifer is just allowing this to happen. Pretty much, yeah. She's just as guilty in my mind. And maybe <laughs> she realizes that. And that's why she heads downtown and has a chat with Officer Kurtz. He's the man who made the assault arrest against Chris. Okay. So uh, let's see their chat. Can I get you a coffee or anything? No, no thanks. Listen, um, my husband is the one who's raping those women. So you said on the phone. Yeah, what, did you just come here to repeat yourself? (laughs) What do you want me to do about it? (laughs) So Jennifer presents circumstantial evidence at the table there against Chris, mainly that he was out of the house each night a woman was attacked. But that's not enough for Officer Kurtz, obviously. He says if Jennifer can produce physical evidence, like the gun or the handcuffs the attacker is known to be using, they may be able to tie the crimes to Chris. She goes home and she finds both items in Chris's trunk Mm -hmm. atop the spare tire. So um, she sends Chris out for formula and phones Officer Kurtz. He's awaiting Chris when Chris returns home and demands to look in his trunk. He finds nothing. Mm. Officer Kurtz and his partner leave. The incriminating evidence has disappeared. But where did it go? Let's go in the house, honey. you are you can't hide from me anymore i wouldn't hide anything from you honey these police are awful nice to come all the way out here for nothing don't you think made me feel safe well protected but i think they've paid us more than their fair share of attention don't you now, Steve, that stuff he's pulling out of the bag, is that what they refer to as a rape kit? You would think. Right. That's a very strange term because right. uh, that is what I would think a deadly justice kit would consist of. Right. But no, it's something else entirely. Oh, okay. Are we almost done? Oh, I thought that's a... <laughs> <laughs> thought you thought I was going to expand on that? <laughs> really? <laughs> I, I thought you had more to say. All right, so... um. <clears throat> One night, Chris has some friends over. Jennifer has left their daughter with Dave. After the friends leave, Chris tells Jennifer he's going for a drive, by which he means another woman is about to be deadly justice. Yeah. Jennifer stealthily follows him in a rental car. Let's be fair. Half the time, he did go to Dairy Queen. (laughs) You know. So she follows him in a rental car, 
And as she sees him about to break into a woman's house, she phones the sheriff's department. Now, while she awaits the fuzz, Jennifer slashes Chris's tires. And they arrive just in time to thwart the deadly justice. And uh, as in the aftermath, Jennifer and Officer Kurtz confront the would-be victim. Not confront. Comfort the would-be victim. Okay. I'm so sorry. The man who attacked you, he's my husband. I know how it feels to be scared like that. I know how awful it is. I'm truly sorry that it happened to you. Mrs. Gallagher, you don't have anything to be sorry about. This is the lady that called in your attack. She's the one who saved you from being raped. Thank you. Oh, thank you. It's okay. Yeah, great. Now, can you introduce Jennifer to all the women she didn't save? Mm. I'm sure they'd be delighted to have a chat with her. You know, I got to be honest, Steve, I was kind of falling asleep by this point in the film. Yeah. And uh, in in my uh, half-asleep mind uh i thought she set him up on this like a sting she's like hey you seen the the new chick that moved in across oh, the street okay. that's actually uh, that's not, actually what i thought happened that's not a bad uh, that wouldn't have been a bad way to go yeah yeah but I, I i guess i'm wrong well we next learned that chris was sentenced to nearly a century in prison wow yeah which is a default life term yeah sure we do that with the understanding that uh these creeps will likely die in prison I mean, you would hope so, but then sometimes they get paroled. And, right, you know, right, right, right. But, but someday, that kind of sentence, it's going to backfire on us in a big way. What happens when advancements in science have us living to the age of 200? Mm. And all of these psychos, murderers, deadly justicers, who are supposed to die behind bars, end up just finishing their sentences and getting released with 50, 100 years left to live. Yeah, that won't be good. Yeah, it's going to be a nightmare. So if we have any judges watching... Please just call it life in prison and not assign a number of years to it. Yeah. Your great, great grandchildren will be glad you did. Agreed. So that ends The Stranger Beside Me. Anything you'd like to add, Chris? No, no, no. You, I'm, I'm ready to rate it. Okay, well, why don't we do the comment of the week first? Great. Okay, you chose this. Let's see it. Uh, oh, yeah, he was one sick puppy. He needed to be put under the prison. Now, I, as we speak about uh, crime and punishment, Steve, this is a new one to me, being put under the prison. So, uh, yeah, there you go. Maybe some judges should consider that instead of a near-life sentence. Well, I think what that means is uh, being dead and buried. Right. I, I suppose. I don't know. But and then, oddly enough, she reposted the exact same thing, <laughs> so that, which prompted someone else to say, yeah, we get it. <laughs> <laughs> so we're not the only ones posting snarky comments under these movies. <laughs> so uh, do you want to write it first, or shall I? Oh, you go ahead. Okay. I'll give it two out of five Meredith Baxters. Okay. I was entertained by it, but it didn't have the twists that, for example, a violation of trust had. We knew practically throughout the film who the perpetrator was. Right. And um, also, I would have given it three Meredith Baxters had Jennifer been charged as an accessory. Okay, yeah. I, I mean, I see what you're saying. You're saying that a case could be made for that. I actually would have thought it would be more interesting if there had been some sort of twist where we found out maybe she was somehow involved. There was no twist in this. There right. was, it was so straightforward, and really nothing happened. Um, I found it profoundly boring, which is why I ended up falling asleep at the end. So um, I was going to give it one Meredith, um, but I'm going to I'm going to make it one and a half. Uh, half of that is uh, Tiffany Amber Thiessen's boobs. Let's be honest. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Well, in that case, is there anything we didn't talk about you might like to talk about? No, I'm, I'm ready to. Hey guys. Oh, how about you, puppet Jamie Walters? How are you? Good. Good. Yeah, we're doing okay. You done with all your movie silliness? I've got something serious to discuss. Uh, uh, all right. Do we want to do this, Steve? Yeah, let, let's, uh, let's hear him out. It's a, it's a story about uh, back in the days of World War II. It's a sad story. 
yeah, that was a it was a sad time in, in many ways. Yeah, you want to shut up and let me tell it? Okay, sorry. There was this concentration camp called Dachau, and the people there were in prison for years for just for the crime of being Jewish. And they were forced into slave labor where they would be worked at, to the point of exhaustion, and they were starved until they were nearly dead. And then one day, these American soldiers came and liberated them, and they gave them food. And they said, you'll be freed. And the, the Jew, Jewish people were so happy. And then these buses pulled up to take them away. And everyone lined up and they said, what is that music? And the bus driver said, oh, I just bought the new Lori Morgan album. And all the Jews said, you know what? We're good. We're going to stay here. <laughs> that is in profoundly bad taste. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> um, so I, you know what? I apologize, Steve. Oh, no problem. Well, you know, puppets, uh, they're uh, temperamental. Yeah. They have opinions, and they're very adamant in those opinions. And we, 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 should, we need all voices in society, right? Yeah, I guess. And, and puppets, puppets among those voices. So um, in that case, I think we did it, right, Chris? I, I suppose we should address why, we, once again, we failed to deliver... On, on something we promised, or, or did we not address it? I don't know. I well, leave we it didn't you. address it. I don't think we have to. It is something that may likely happen in the future. So, yeah. But if you want to talk about it, go ahead. Well, we promised last week that we would start kind of a new thing. In addition to the movie of the week, we'd be talking about a TV series. But we hit a bit of a snafu with that. We're working through it, and we hope to b that'll be resolved shortly. So. Yeah. So uh, keep, um, keep an eye on us, and uh, hopefully that project... We'll kick into action soon. You didn't say uh, like, comment, subscribe. No, well, you just did. I think that's good enough. All right. All right. And also share. <laughs> yeah. Just just do whatever. Just get, we need some eyeballs on this. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, Puppet Jamie Waters, Chris Morgani, Jim, I'm the bull. Oscar Wee Wee. Oscar Wawa. Tigers. Eat them raw. We did it. Uh, <laughs>